found my um, time in this conference so far really interesting. If you listened to the things I've listened to here and there, you would have the impression that everything was sorted. You know, there's, um, there's been a lot of talk about the need to recognize uh, heritage and culture and warmth and interest and, you know, people stuff generally and energy and vitality and uh, place not space and all of that. There's been um, talk about that thing that moved from blue collar to white collar to no collar and um, the sense of these sort of energized young things who will come and live in these amazing cities that we're making for them and make them competitive, which is to say global, and that's all great. Um, and maybe, therefore, we can all rest assured that the days uh, of greedy developers taking everything and giving nothing back are over. Maybe from now on, we're all on the same page and we can all be comfortable with that. Everything's sunny. Uh, but it's my job, of course, to notice things, <laughs> especially things that don't quite match up. And there are several things that have caught my attention. One is, these I've got little tags in my head. This first one is called, uh, Where are the Fluffy Slippers? Which is to say, um, there's been a lot of rhetoric about people, about what uh, Frank Sartor, who was Lord Mayor when I was a councillor in Sydney some time ago, um, used to call fluffy slippers. Um, and yet, there aren't many of them actually involved in the debate, talking about the future of the city in which they live. So that's interesting. Um, there's a sense, too, and this is the second thing, which is, in my head, it's tagged, will they learn? Um, I've been struck, struck by how similar the, the, this imaginary uh, populace, energized and energizing populace, is um, to that Corbusian thing, you might remember, that glorious idea that, and he said, generations are coming to be born that will learn to live in my radiant city. If you, um, glorious it was, but of course, wrong. <laughs> uh, that can happen. Three is this idea that um, the urban equals the dense equals towers, and that altogether those things equal sustainability, which may be so and may not be so, in my opinion. So we're going to have a quick look at that. Uh, and then there's this strange fact that the first time around, you know, sort of, what, this time last century, uh, towers were sold and bought as an antidote to congestion. Um, and now they bring it, at least if we call congestion uh, and density the same thing, a and glorify that and um, talk about density as sustainability, which, again, to some extent it is. So those things are interesting, and I, but I find them curious because there are sort of contradictions in there, which always interest me. Um, here's a picture of um, <laughs> uh, the Queen, actually, uh, on Sydney Town Hall balcony. And next to her, which I can't point you to, except the one with all the hair there in the blue robe, is me, not next to her, about four or five along, as a councillor. Um, uh, my point really is just that I've never been opposed to tall buildings. I have no issues with tall buildings per se. And... Um, as a councillor, I was instrumental in helping some of them happen. And as this is what I do for a living, um, apart from being an academic, I also write a weekly column in the Sydney Morning Herald. And as a, an architect turned writer, I've argued for density and for cities and indeed for tall buildings for decades. Um, and even um, from the point of view of sustainability, arguing, of course, with people like Ed Glazer, who you will remember wrote The Triumph of the City, um, who argues that the, gre the greenest form of living pattern is, of course, a dense city centre. So all of that I, I agree with, um, and, and I've even done a MOOC, a massive open online course on Central Park in Sydney, uh, Central Park, comma, Sydney, um, and the MOOC argues for re-enchanting the city as a form of green density, or what 
Bianca Ingalls, you probably know, calls hedonistic sustainability. So um, the tall building thing um, I'm on board with, broadly speaking. I also like tall for aesthetic reasons. This is, I think, one of the finest tall buildings in Sydney, which some of you will know. Um, in fact, some of you were involved in. Um, this is Aurora Place. Um, Bronzo Piano, I think it's really pretty, not just as an object, but also workable as a as habitat. So this tall buildings and urban ha habitat thing. Uh, I think Aurora should, if anything, be taller than it is. And I think the same about this one, which is um, One Bly by Christoph Ingenhoven and Architectus. And um, also a beautiful building, also very fine at street level in quite different ways. Also very particular to Sydney, but quite also international. Um, and also, I think, should be at least twice as tall as it is, although I have to say that as a councillor, I'm probably one of the main people responsible for it not being taller and having generated sun planes in Sydney, which um, still limit the heights of buildings. Uh, and also, I think tall, bu tall buildings can be fabulous in terms of excitement. You'll remember Corbusier's words um, when he went to New York City for the first time, and he says, a city in the process of becoming overwhelming, amazing, exciting, violently alive, a wilderness of stupendous experiment towards the new order that is to replace the current tumult. Um, and even in my children's novel, which is this one, I wrote this little thing about the kids escape from school and they go to the city. And it was interesting because kids never get to see cities, of course, so they land up in um, Bridge Street and they get excited by, and this is a little quote, the streets are narrow and bent, the old goat tracks that were never meant for skyscrapers. But for Cairo, the shadow itself is part of the excitement. It feels like a private world full of intricate plots and encounters that no one sees. She watches a couple of barristers, wigged and robed, whispering together as they meander across the street, followed by a line of young men with shiny shoes and file-stacked trolleys. The heat of the day is now intense. With snatches of bright sun on their wigs, the barristers look hot and overdressed. But the instant they reach the other side, the shadows reclaim them into their walled and private world. So that sense of... Um, interest and intricacy and mystery in cities is something to which I'm rather partial. Uh, so broadly speaking, I'm on board. But there is this curious thing about where are the fluffy slippers? You know, um, this is an image that appeared near where I until recently lived in Surrey Hills uh, recently. Um, and it's just, I took a photo of it because I was interested that this uh, epitomizes people's fear, you know, and it's important not to forget people are still frightened of building height, not just density, but height. And it's real, and they feel that their neighborhoods are, once again, threatened by this. And you can see from the drawing that the, that the tall buildings are the bad guys, you know, the little sweet things are what everybody loves, and the tall black things are the ones that everybody fears. So that's an interesting um, phenomenon, and it means that tall buildings are intensely political. I'm not sure there's been very much discussion about politics here. Someone who knew this, though, um, the, the, the politicization, if you like, of the skyscraper was, of course, Harry Seidler, who was always adept, and not that he's got a skyscraper here, but he was always adept at playing the political game. Here he is, sort of with bedroom eyes towards the camera. Here he is again. You know, this lovely thing. Uh, this was in a 1950 magazine called People, and it's, it's sort of, it's all about modern life, you know, rubber-soled shoes and Harry being um, a, a kind of harbinger of minimalism. And uh, this, too, used to send me little notes. Uh, so uh, not just me, uh, anybody who could be useful in the... PR thing for tall buildings, which was sort of his life's work in Sydney. And yet, generally in Sydney now, there's a sort of view that uh, people like me, the media and the public in particular, are dangerous and should be excluded from the discussion. Uh, I <laughs> Even with the recent release of the big new metropolitan plan for Sydney, people like me uh, don't get invited to the press conference. You know, so this, th there's, uh, I think this is a mistake. Um, 
the sense that if you exclude them, they won't be dangerous. Uh, <laughs> I think it's generally much better, also more grown up, to involve in the discussion people who will be involved in the buildings and the cities. Um, so there's that, which is an acronym with which you'll all be familiar. Um, but it seems to me that there's a lot of emphasis on the tall buildings, and although there's some discussion of the urban habitat, when you look at what's actually made, um, uh, which is where, you know, people are, they not just live, not just residentially, but where people, people, ordinary human beings spend time, the habitat bit of it doesn't get um, made with the same degree of dedication and interest and excitement, and I'm curious about why that is. I think there are some reasons for that. Um, it's particularly curious because, of course, this woman, Jane Jacobs, is now a recognized hero, and, you know, she wrote her book, the first one, The um, Death and Life of Great American Cities, back in how long ago? 1961. You know, this, is, this stuff is not new to us. Um, this is a picture from the Sydney uh, City of Sydney Strategic Plan 1971, which was pretty much along the same lines as Jacob's thinking, which is to say it was about um, making the city a place for people. This stuff is still our rhetoric, but my suggestion is that we're not really doing it as well as we might. Uh, 1979 was the date of this AD magazine, which became famous. It was guest edited by Michael Graves, no less, uh, and it drew the world's attention, at least the architectural world's attention, to this map, which is a very important um, piece of symbolism, amongst other things, which is, as you'll know, perhaps the Nolly map of Rome, 1748. Um, but 1979 was when it became world famous be as, as an image of um, how you can actually make the spaces rather than the buildings the figure like the primary thing. And that's a mental flip, which I think we don't do enough of. There's also, of course, when I was a student, which is some time ago, um, even then, I think it was old, this acronym SLOPE, S-L-O-A-P, space left over after planning, you know. And still, too often, that is what's left for the public. You make your buildings, and then you, um, what's left over becomes something that you call a laneway, although quite often it's actually not a laneway, it's just the leftover space. And I'm reminded of a conversation I had with um, a developer who shall remain nameless of a development on the western edge of Sydney CBD, which is now quite large. Um, and he said, you'll be very pleased with us because, to me, uh, because we've... Um, now that we've got the DAs for our buildings, uh, now we're going to get the urban designer. So I've just appointed an urban designer. And that's the order it happens. And you get the buildings done, and then you do the urban design, which, of course, is, <coughs> I think it's a technical term, ask about. <laughs> um, all right, the second thing, will they learn? Will, will generations come to, who will learn to live in the buildings, the wonderful things that we're designing for them? This. Um, the situation of this exclusion of the public leads, of course, and this might be particularly pronounced in Sydney, uh, but I suspect it happens everywhere, leads to a situation that feels a lot like a war. And in that war in Sydney, the best um, mayor by far that we've ever had, which is Clover Moore, um, who's the longest serving, most the highest achieving, and most loved by far, in the sense that um, there have been at least three pieces of legislation designed to get rid of her, and every single time they've been enacted, her vote has only increased. So she's the most successful politician by a long shot, and mayor by a long shot, and if she was a man, I'd suggest there'd be books written about her by now, and she'd have a number of gongs, AOs and things. Um, as it is, she's regularly pilloried in the press, um, which of course is the Murdoch press, so there's, um, there's subtext there. But it's interesting the degree to which this is happening, and, and there's a level of misogyny, of course, um, in this, as there was in this sort of nasty woman thing, and it's, <coughs> it's everywhere suddenly, and this is curious. And it's even more curious that I'm saying this to uh, 
such an extraordinarily male-dominated audience. I don't think I've been in such a male-dominated audience for quite some time. And that in itself is interesting, um, since these are, you know, you're the city makers. So in Australia, this plays out in lots of ways, but it's um, increasingly evident. And I think that its relevance to city making is that modernism um, acted itself out as a, as a sort of war on interiority, a war on, if you like, the feminine aspects of the city. Of course, Corbusier's um, radiant city had no feminine aspects. There were no interiors here, thank you very much. There's just buildings in space. And I think it points to a, a severe imbalance, um, not just between male and female, but between the sort of solid and void um, building and space, and also between um, public and private interests. Uh, which So that brings it back to governance and politicians um, and public service, the public servants who should be there ensuring that the public interests are equally um, fought for with the private interests. But in fact, neoliberalism, of course, has meant that the government has gone to the other side um, and, and sees itself as a sort of faux business. So there is nobody, including governments who are paid to do this, defending the public interest in, in city making. Um, then there's this question of whether these words are actually the same thing. Ed Glazer, you're probably aware, says cities are defined as, can be defined as uh, a single quality, which is proximity, closeness to things and people. And proximity, of course, is pretty much the same thing as density. And yet, um, I think that there is some unpicking that's useful. This is Central Park, Sydney, which I'm, I've been very interested in and written a lot about, and I'm broadly speaking in favour of, even though it is, I, it quite by Sydney standards, um, quite dense. It really feels very dense. I don't know what the FSR is exactly, or quite how you'd measure it in that situation. It was named, um, as you probably know, as um, world's best tall building, I think, in 2014. Um, and I'm very interested in that. I'm also very, oh yes, and this is one of its charming features, which is part of the heliostat arrangement, which reflects sunlight down into the courtyard, the garden, if you like, the park behind the building. Um, and it makes this space, which is on the southern side, which is why it needs the sunlight uh, reflected. And this is what it looks like now on Broadway, which used to be one of Sydney's um, nastiest and toughest and sootiest and filthiest streets, and still is most of its... Um, Length, but now on this piece of street, you, your violets brush your cheek. Uh, and that's charming. It is charming, and it makes a big difference. So the, the bringing of beauty, um, the argument of the MOOC that I made is that beauty makes this sustainable. In the sense, it's been accused of being greenwash. I think it's not, because people are very drawn to it. And that single act of the beauty of the green wall and so on drawing people means that it becomes sustainable because the danger is if we build our buildings and our cities and our places ugly, people will vote with their feet and walk. Uh, this is another one I quite like, even though it's a little bit maybe ordinary as a sculpture. This is on the ANZ Tower. But it's street, the Richard Francis Jones, um, uh, FJMT. So at street level, it, it makes a point of making uh, quite an interesting, complex little space that includes a few heritage buildings and engages buildings across the street and so on, and making uh, a space that has intimacy and intricacy and texture, uh, as well as sunlight and stuff. And it also has a sense of interiority. So it's defined. It's an in instead of just a around. And I think that makes a huge difference. Um, the, these are buildings that I think do not make these gestures. <coughs> and they promised to, but didn't. I've been, I've been very critical of Barangaroo in the past, and no doubt that will happen again. Um, but one of the reasons I'm critical is that there was talk at the time um, of an iconic place for the public. There's, this was all public land, 22 hectares of it, or 26 or whatever. Um, which is to say about uh, a third of the, of the entire CBD, vast amount of public land. And yet the 
what's been given back to the public seems to me to be fairly, um, what should we say, threadbare in terms of quality. This is, um, this is what I'm talking about. So most of the public spaces in cities are in fact streets and making streets that have this sense of interiority that can become places where people actually like to spend time even if it's snowing as it is in this little Hampstead Lane called Flask Walk. Um, that's what I think we should be aiming for. This is an example in Redfern but there are dozens of them around Sydney. We're quite good actually at making streets that people love to be in. Most of them are far too narrow, far too congested for anything sensible. Um, but I think what you can't do is just talk about them, um, pretend that you're, this is actually discussed at the time at the start of um, Barangaroo, pretend that you're making Central Park and actually do this, which, um, which is Barangaroo last night, I was there, um, where people are getting blown off their feet even though it was actually quite a windy evening. Um, but I had to hold on to that pole there, otherwise I would have been blown with it. Um, so, so, I mean, we know this stuff about wind and buildings. We know that wind makes places uninhabitable if you don't work with it. This is not news. I think um, there are lots of reasons why this happened, but principally I think it's a failure of governance. I'm not even going to talk about that. There's history to this, which is to do with fear of tall buildings, and I am going to rush through that. But this is 1901, just after we had the last bubonic plague in Sydney, um, and a fellow called Harry Clegg jumped to his death when this building burned down, uh, it, it being watched by all the lunchtime shopping crowds down in the Haymarket. Um, and that, put, that single thing put Sydney off skyscrapers. Not that this was a skyscraper, or that skyscrapers are even similar. This was actually a furniture warehouse, which was in, inflammable, of course, and full of inflammable stuff, and, every, and, and quite a lot of people died. But his particular death, because it was so dramatic, um, meant that um, we enacted laws to ban skyscrapers, which for the next 50 years, so um, we, up until 1957, skyscrapers were banned, which meant that by the time, that's the plan of it, by the time, <laughs> um, cartoons of the time, uh, and that was the tallest building in Sydney at the time, which still exists, Kalwala Chambers on the corner of King and Castlereagh. Funny little thing, rather quaint. Um, there were lots of dreamings. This was 1929 image of Sydney in 1979 by a guy called Norman Weeks, who thought that we would all be flying around those little helicopter things in the sky. But Sydney became extremely dense, and so by the time... Um, these two guys came on the scene, which is Seidler and Dusseldorp. Everybody was desperate for what they brought, which was towers and tower thinking. And that, of course, is Australia Square's plan, which you can see even from the plan has this kind of heroic, radiant quality. But this brings us to the final point, which is that then it was all about curing congestion. In other words, an antidote to density. Um, that's Australia Square, of course. And this is, you probably can't read that, but there's Harry Seidler arguing for, um, against congestion and for towers because they would remove not only congestion of um, buildings uh, on the street, but of people on the street. He didn't like people messing up the streets. So the, so the fact that Australia Square's public space, as it's known, even though it's not public, properly speaking, um, is off the street and actually destroys the streets that it fronts is quite deliberate. Sydney 1961, when it was still low rise, Sydney 1971, 10 years later exactly, uh, seven, sorry, 60 and 70 they are, um, and you can see the tall buildings beginning to pop through, including Australia Square. Um, through, but you can still see those goat tracks of streets and how dense Sydney had been. Um, and that's the plan. And the, that um, this circle thing with the um, radiant spokes is, of course, Australia Square. But you can spot, you can actually spot the side of the buildings where the ones that actually put all that space around themselves. So that was entirely deliberate. But um, and then that, which is the MLC, Seidler's MLC, which destroyed this, which was Row Street, which was a little home for Bohemia in the city centre. And of course, this, which is Blues Point Tower, um, which was, of course, never meant to be quite as isolated as that, but ended up that way. <laughs> and the famous 
cartoon about Harry Seidler, which he sued over um, and won. Um, and it's all about those two and all about the dot and the line, but we all come back to that. So, so the tower thing is really about that dot and line thinking, which is about height and speed. And you can see that it doesn't automatically have popular support. So the, then the question is, how can we have both? Can we have, this is 50 Bridge Street, um, as you will have seen this in these last couple of days. Can we make these buildings, um, and this is the other end of Circular Quay, can we generate a more interesting, I know there's lots of talk about ground planes and how they're interesting. I look at that at the ground level and I think, I'm just gonna get depressed here. Um, but then once you get outside the city center, it's, it's more depressing. This is in Redfern. Um, where these tiny little flats just sort of stare into each other across dark, windy laneways where people scurry around. And then there's huge plans for all those towers to spread right back without any governance. And this is um, Bankstown to Sydenham along the railway line. So the lack of governance saying we need public interest to be looked after, I think is a huge, huge issue for Sydney. My feeling, and this is Marrickville, and this is, <laughs> um, I said before, it's like when everyone crowds to one side of the ship. To my mind, it's, it's all about getting decent governance, which recognizes itself as championing public interests to have a decent muscular conversation with private interests. But as soon as government says, we're on this side and everybody's on the same side of the ship, well, you know what happens next. So we need to be able to see both. The, the solid and the void, the built and the spatial and masculine and feminine. So I think it can have both, but I think at the moment, Sydney in particular is going about it the wrong way. Thank you. <laughs>